gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, my name is Matt Cheney, um, and this is Eric Gallagher, and we are the co-editors of the moment for the Revelator magazine. Let me tell you a little bit about it before we get going. I have to read it because the history is just so immense. Welcome to all of you returning readers who have followed the Revelator for years, whose parents and grandparents did the same. You readers who wait impatiently by the mailbox for the next issue to appear, and who have bookcases bowed beneath the weight of yellowed editions you lack the heart to discard. <laughs> Welcome also to our first-time readers flicking through our virtual pages more out of curiosity than any sense of our enormous past, the weight we, your trusty editors, carry on our thin shoulders. Welcome to the jaded, degraded, and morally constipated. Welcome to the crazy, lazy, and prescriptionally hazy. Welcome to the waiters, satyrs, and Johnny-come-laters. Welcome to the sycophants, hierophants, and anorexic elephants. <laughs> Welcome to the lost hearts, tossed hearts, bossed tarts, and denizens of all night quickie marks. Welcome, <laughs> one and all, to The Revelator. We trust you won't be disappointed. The Revelator was first published in 1876 and has been published ever since then in a variety of formats. Broadsheet, newspaper, eight tracks and cassette, mono and stereo, sometimes free, sometimes in expensive limited editions. But whatever its formats, The Revelator has always been the first place to look for a no-holds-barred approach to the truth and damn the consequences. It was in The Revelator in fact, in its very first issue, that one found an eyewitness account of the Northfield Bank robbery. It was in the Revelator that the first authentic authenticated photographs of the Thunderbird, the Unca Tela, and the giant squid appeared. It was the Revelator that unearthed the lost correspondence of Howard Phillips Lovecraft. And it was the Revelator that first published <laughs> the unexpurgated Watergate transcripts. Your editors, Matthew Cheney and Eric Schaller, are proud to carry on this grand tradition now in a free online edition. In each issue of The Revelator, you will find the best fiction, nonfiction, comics, and art that the world has to offer. We say it's the best because that's the truth and the all. And now, Eric Schaller will introduce us up. I'm Eric Schaller, one of the co-editors of The Revelator, and the audiovisual help for this uh, event. My main role is to simply push a button occasionally. Excellent. Uh, and our other contributors today. <laughs> Mr. Bose. That's right, I am Mr. Bose. Yes, what is Mr. Bose? I have to tell you something about myself. I'm Rick Bose, and I've been writing speculative fiction for almost the last 30 years, but in this case, I have written a story that isn't speculative fiction. It is nothing but the truth. In and it'll be on our next issue, which will be uh, sometime in the next four or five years. <laughs> I'm Brian Slattery, I'm an editor, writer, and musician, and also occasionally a tech and music. <laughs> My name is Sonia Tate. Uh, I write short stories and poetry, and I ended up in this project because I wrote a love poem to Lovecraft, which surprised the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's marvelous. We're going to begin first with uh, a piece from our very first issue to sort of get a sense of the history. This is called A True and Reliable Account of the Attempted Daylight Robbery of the National Bank of Northfield, Minnesota by the Notorious James Younger Gang, as related by a witness to the events. And it's by W. Ira Davenport. Many stories have recently come over the telegraph wires about the events in Northfield, Minnesota this September past, but I assure you, none are as verifiable as mine, which is a story told from true experience and the witness of my own eyes. No one has yet presented as full an account as I can offer. Though I am not a man of letters, and so must trust the reader to forgive any infelicities of prose, I assure you that the story I intend to relate is singular enough to carry its own burdens. I had only recently arrived in the city of Northfield that morning of September the 7th, having come originally from New Hampshire on a journey of salesmanship. My journey began at the railroad station in Ashland, New Hampshire, where I boarded with three valises filled not with clothes or accoutrement, but with bottles of St. Matthew's Passionate Liqueur and Tonic, <laughs> a restorative of my own devising. It had proved remarkably powerful as an aid to women and men suffering the effects of forlornness, and it was nothing less 
than a command from God himself that sent me across the country with my humble wares. And by the time I arrived in Minnesota, I had brought inspiration and grace to so many lives that I had but three bottles remaining. My pockets were, I will confess, stuffed with coins and dollars. And after performing, performing my morning ablutions in Northfield, I resolved to bring my modest treasury to the National Bank and secure my fortune. I woke late and tarried long over breakfast, so that by the time I made my way to the barber, the afternoon light already cast its long shadows across the land. It was through these shadows that the eight men who would soon be so notorious rode on their gallant steeds. Four of the eight men rode into town just as I stepped out of the barber's emporium, and I believe I paid more attention to them than the citizens of Northfield themselves did at first, because it was I was not accustomed to seeing wealthy cattlemen, which these riders, outfitted in long dust-colored coats, presented themselves to be. Fortune was with me that day, for just as I was about to enter the bank, I heard shouts from the second group of four men who, when they crossed the bridge entering town, drew navy revolvers and dashed across the street, shouting for all citizens to get inside the buildings and ornamenting their shouts with the most fiendish curses and imprecations. Three of the eight men entered the bank, while five stayed outside, waving their pistols, firing them occasionally in the air, and warning all to stay away. The men were not, in fact, cattle dealers, but were instead desperados. The three who entered the bank had done so with the intention of robbing it. They had ordered the three bank employees, the cashier, Mr. Haywood, Mr. A.E. Bunker, assistant cashier, and Mr. Frank Wilcox, clerk, to hold up their hands and open the money vaults. Mr. Haywood refused to do so, despite one of the men holding a knife to his throat. The man then pressed the muzzle of a pistol to Mr. Haywood's temple. The brave Haywood continued to refuse, and the cowardly desperado fired a bullet into his brain. Haywood fell dead. The robbers then ordered Mr. Bunker to open the vault, and he said he did not know the combination. The robbers then made demonstrations toward him, and he ran out the rear door of the bank, upon which one of the desperate men fired, shooting Mr. Bunker in the shoulder. Mr. Wilcox, who stood quietly by, was not interfered with. The actions inside the bank I know from newspaper stories, not having witnessed it myself. I heard the shots, and those decided me not to venture into the bank at that time. <laughs> I found a position of safety on the other side of the hardware store, from which I was able to observe the extraordinary events that followed. The people of the city of Northfield are of an extraordinary character, fearless and noble, and the moment they discovered their bank was under attack, they, men, women, and children alike, it seemed, took arms against the foes. The memory of the war of the last decade was strong in everyone's minds, and many of the citizens, I am certain, suspected the robbers had been among the traitorous slavers who had fought so shamefully against the Union cause, for it is only such men that descend to an action as dastardly as the robbing of the National Bank. A young man in a building opposite to the bank opened a window and extended a Springfield rifle through it. His aim was true. One of the villains fell dead, mere footsteps from my feet. A young man fired again and again hit his target, though not in as fatal a segment of the body. The man fell from the horse he had mounted seconds before and crawled in search of shelter from the storm of bullets, his blood mingling with the dirt of the street. Another bold citizen wounded a third robber, but this one held to his horse and escaped. The young man, whose name I discovered was Wheeler, organized a band of, dozen, of a dozen citizens to follow in pursuit of the villain. They set off on their noble quest and were to succeed at capturing some of the men, but the fates of two others believed to have been the leaders and, perhaps, the notorious brothers, Frank and Jesse James, have been, until now, unknown. After Wheeler had led his party in search of justice, I decided to continue on my journeys and so packed my valises and climbed into the old mare that had carried me so faithfully to the honorable town of Northfield. We traveled at a reluctant speed on a small path out of the town, and two hours had not passed when I saw on the horizon a most remarkable sight. At first, I believed a particularly dark cloud had obscured an area of the sky, but the movement of the object proved that that to be an unfounded thought. Clouds do not, as a rule, bob and bounce. <laughs> Nor, in my experience, do they produce sounds similar to those of a steam conveyance like the wails of an iron banshee. The orbital object at first appeared to be moving in the direction of I and my horse, growing larger in the sky, but it soon changed its path and settled downward in the distance. At this moment, 
Two men on a single horse rode toward me, and from the coats they wore and the malevolent countenances they displayed, I knew them to be members of the murderous outlaw band. Get gone from here, the lead rider said to me, and for a brief moment of terror, I believed he would soon shoot me dead, but as I did not, I expect, present a frightful figure to them, their intent was quite different. Beyond here, the second said, and I noted that his accent was indeed that of a barbarous southern trader, <laughs> lies something not natural, something sent by the demons of hell. Two men on the horse rode past swiftly, turning in a direction parallel to the city of Northfield, while I and my steed sauntered forth. I do not trust the spawn of the Confederacy, nor have I ever consented to one of their demands. They commanded us to go in a direction other than the one we traveled in, and so we stayed our course. Once again, my distrust of the bloodthirsty Southerners proved well-founded. Had we not continued in the direction from which we began, my horse and I might never have lived into the evening. After traveling down the path for perhaps another hour, I heard a terrible, unearthly sound again, but different this time from the previous, where the object in the sky before emanated a screeching, ear-aching noise. Now the sound had more harmony to it, something akin to a chorus of angels, though not so heavenly. Imagine the most beautiful woman singers in the world hollering down a metal tube, and you may begin to approximate in your mind the sound that echoed through the air at that moment. The sound came from behind us now rather than in front, and both I and my horse turned our heads in its direction. The spheroid object we had previously seen from a distance now proved to be behind us and much closer than before. Details of its design became apparent. It was a flying machine, but before I knew it to be mechanical, its steel glistened in the sun, it was unlike any invention of my experience. Its edges were finely curved like molded silver, and various protuberances seem to have grown organically out of its central form. Additionally, it issued bright bubbles of green and yellow light from portals in its top and bottom. As I watched, transfixed, the object issued a bolt of blue light that brought fire and smoke to the ground around it. Screams filled the air, screams tinged with the distinctive drawl of a man from the south. <laughs> I know that sound, and it is one that gives me joy. For it is always the sound of a coward going to eternal damnation. <laughs> the bolt of blue light struck again, and again fire and smoke and screams burst into the air, which itself smelled singed with righteous vengeance. Hardly had I time to conceive what had happened, what was happening, than the object moved upward and away, becoming but a dot against the darkening sky. I am by nature a curious man, a devotee of science and scholarship, and I could not resist the temptation to investigate the extraordinary occurrence. Though my horse was reluctant, I spurred it toward the site of the conflagration. What we found when we arrived was a clearing amidst the forest, the central path wound through. A hillock of rocks stood at the far end, and it was these rocks that provided the most astounding sight, for against them appeared a shadow uncast by any object, a shadow of two men on a horse. I dismounted and cautiously approached the scene. I quickly discovered the rock itself was issuing smoke, for what I had taken to be a shadow was, in fact, a dusting of ash. The men had, I deduced, then incinerated against the rock. Moments after I came to this conclusion, a soft rain began to fall, and the smoldering rocks turned the raindrops to steam. I returned to my horse, determined to ride into Northfield and find a witness to this most extraordinary moment, but by the time I was able to bring them back from the city to the clearing, the rain had turned torrential and all evidence of the destruction cast upon the desperados had washed away. I fear the good people of Northfield did not give great credence to my account, for which I cannot fault them, for I had. For had I, a man of inclined to science, not witnessed it all with my own eyes, I too would be of a skeptical mind. As anyone who has benefited from the restorative properties of St. Matthew's passionate liqueur and tonic can attest, however, I am a man of honesty and truth. And it is with honesty and truth that I present all I saw that notorious day in Northfield. I do believe justice has been brought to that noble city, whether by God or some other entity, and it is with utmost confidence that I proclaim the suspected leaders of the attack on the National Bank, Frank and Jesse James, to be no longer among the land of the living. The vengeance brought against them was no less than they deserved, swift, vast, and beyond anything heretofore seen in this world. And now, two poems. wouldn't necessarily 
he talks about going to the cinema in Providence and basically just hanging out there all day. Um, he was particularly fond of a 1933 film called Berkeley Square starring Leslie Howard, um, in which a man gets jumped backwards in time into the body of his ancestor of the same name in the 19th, late 18th century. It actually serves as a starting point for some of Lovecraft's own fiction because he loved the idea of being able to escape into the past um, despite the fact that the movie ultimately comes down by saying that you can't do that, it's a horrible idea, rocks fall as it dies. Um, but he had major world building arguments for the film, namely that if there really was a temporal body swap, it's one thing for a 20th century man who finds himself in a time that he's studied, but the 18th century original finding himself suddenly dropped into 1933 should have gone stark staring bonkers. Uh, and the film did not indicate that this had happened, therefore Lovecraft thought it sucked in that respect <laughs> and wrote fix-it fiction, um, which eventually became a, a belief that was Anyway, I, I went to a Lovecraft film festival at the Royal Theatre in Cambridge last year and was watching things like the recent styles called Hulu and the Universal style Whisper in Darkness that the same group made, and then the epically awful 19th horror starring <laughs> Stockwell mustache. <laughs> <laughs> and, and wondering what would have happened if Lovecraft were watching with me and concluded he would probably have had a nervous breakdown. Um, and might not have been very happy to be sitting next to me anyway, because as strangely fond as I feel of him, the fact remains that from his perspective, um, I'm Jewish, I'm descended from several different groups of immigrants, and I've wanted to be ill since I was four. So <laughs> <laughs> Only have drowned in sunlight, flickering silverly like the age of the stars against the astronomer's eye, the dead past still shining, luring us on into the dark night of our hands and cross. The second poem is called Settling Accounts, and it is simply because I read the Master and Margarita at an impressionable age. I fell in love with a demon. Streetcar lines and the dizzying lindens of a city made of mists and ink. Writers and witches changed partners beneath the full moon, but I traced the taste of trickster and allowed a check jacket and a string of showbiz promises, trying to glimpse through this cracked lens to a world where no language needed interpreting the lies. No one burned the book I never wrote him or asked me to fly from the Sparrow Hill, writing beside a black pack of days of spare. Nightly I sit up with the other mad poet, going to the devil on my own. I was among those hired to survey the other. I 
and that Lovecraft drew mutual acquaintances in New York City. His race manifested in casual remarks about people he saw when he left his apartment on the subway. But I was more tolerant than intolerance then, and less brave than I am now, and I could overlook it. When he heard where I was working, he expressed a strong desire to accompany me on my sight visits. I agreed to it. For racism aside, he was a fascinating man, and could pay his own way. We were on the last to walk in the Swift River Valley. By then, the woodpeckers, the army of men with axes and sledgehammers that Boston sent to tear down the towns on the river's bank, had already turned everything into piles of splintered timbers and broken masonry. While I ensured that the nearby forest had been cleared far back enough to accommodate the reservoir, the woodpeckers set the piles on fire across the entire valley until it all was buried. They were very drunk and having too much fun, and the exiled townspeople who had gathered for their very watch were angry. They'd been like that since they arrived, breaking things with tools all day and booze all night, they told us. Just can't fathom why they have to love what they're doing so much. They looked toward Boston and shook their heads. Lovecraft told them that millions of people there would have drinking water thanks to them. He was trying to be noble, perhaps trying to find some dignity in it. It was a bad idea. Let me tell you something, they said. Most of the people in Boston will never even know this happened, or what their thirst did to the places where we grew up. They told Lovecraft about the last dance at the town hall, which was supposed to be over at midnight. But spilled outside and went on for another two hours, with people dancing and crying, trying to say goodbye. It's a good thing most of them aren't here to see this, they said. And then the low crowd, too bad you are. The situation was worse because the people were more than angry about having to leave. A family who owned a lot of land tried to fight the government's condemnation of it in court and lost, and retaliated by burning down one of their houses. A few others killed themselves. One man told his daughter he needed to go out to the barn and went out there and hang himself in the rafters. Another man slid his wrists. They could not imagine living if they had to do it anywhere else. The Providence got all the land it needed and sent it to woodpeckers to clear it. Lovecraft and I were there for that. We watched a team of drunk men hack at the bottom floor of the house with axes and pull the place over with ropes and massive shears. They did it again and again. They had no idea what they were doing. And there were so many of them, and so many of them were drunk, and it didn't matter. It was a massacre. It was a massacre. A woman sat at the edge of what would be the shore of the reservoir and looked at us. God got it wrong, she said. First it's fire, then water. Lovecraft this time was a victim of circumstance, the right man in the wrong place. She took him by the shoulders and said, It will happen to you too, all of you. In time, everything will catch fire and then drown. Everything. It was obvious she had lost her mind. Her fingers had dug far enough into Lovecraft's shoulders that they made holes in his jacket. For a few long moments before I pried her off and her face and words were all he knew. It was quiet after that, all the way back to Providence and the train. On the platform, I asked him if he was all right, and he said he was. But when I read the story he wrote later, I knew he was lying. For the towns and the fire and the woodpeckers, the men in Quam and the woman in Situate were nowhere on the page, which to me meant that they were still in his head somewhere, as they are in mine. But he didn't know how to get them out or save himself.
translating them into speech. They didn't want to have actors doing recreations, so they ran the Morse code through a speech synthesizer. And you hear the messages from the Titanic and the Carpathia, other ships involved in that night. Um, it's a fairly lengthy recording, it was made available for free, you could probably still find it. And it's an extraordinary thing, um, because they were quite right to keep human voices out of it um, and to give you as close to both the impersonality and the urgency and the humans on the other side of the original translation into Morse um, as they could with the human voices. So I listened to that um, on April 14th of last year, and then later in the night wound up writing a poem, which was kind of annoying since I've been trying to go to sleep all week. <laughs> it's dedicated to Thomas Andrew, the shipwright of the Titanic, um, who went down with the ship, and the famous story about him is that he was last in one of the staterooms um, looking at a portrait over the mantel adjusting hands on the clock. It's one of the few things that James Cameron's Titanic is in fact ambiguous about. Um, you can find him played there by Edgar Garber in The Night to Remember um, by Michael Goodwin, I think. And the steward running by looked in through the door and saw him and said, aren't you even going to try for it, Mr. Andrews? And he made no reply. And that was the last of the scene that I saw. The ghost I see walking the rust soft wreckage is Thomas Andrews, drowned Daedalus in the maze of his own melted wings, his constant notebook filled with the weight of waters, suitcases, coal, shoe leathers, grave straws, steel. Silence and subsidence are mathematical certainties, like the glare of treasure seekers, flashing nonsense signals where the chatter of Kate Grace still runs in the halls, his longing to the shipwright weaves his name in steam and rivets, his bones in the painted waters of Plymouth Sound. The man with prurying brows without his coat on has gone down with his heart, the last of the insoluble problems of the engineer's trade. How to bear the memory, carrying a strain between what we know and what it matters. A life jacket floating in the unpopulated.
Now to finish us off with a preview of uh, our third online issue of The Revelator, due sometime before the end of the millennium, we have an uh, excerpt from a story by Richard Bowes. full of sounds of breaking glass and running noise and ladders rising. I watched the fireman, especially the one who had carried me. Because of him, I wasn't afraid. They put the fire out, but my mother and I were in a taxi headed for her mother's house over in Dorchester. We passed the Franklin Park Zoo, and up on the hill was the giraffe house, with the two giraffes out and their long necks out against the moon, like men. And after that, when anyone asks me what I want to be when I grow up, I say, a fireman. Because of that amazing night, and everyone would smile and nod, and they approved. A couple of years later, we were living in the D Street housing project in South Boston. Built for returning servicemen, the place was dark when we started. My parents weren't like the other blue collar, no collar people. I had a little brother now. My mother was not. Casey. 